Greeting everyone. This is the speaker at that why. His presentation is small scale infrastructure management with Python based tools. Please welcome him. Hello. So um, thanks for being here. The the talk is here. Of course, this the the host already told us. And a little bit self introduction. So I am Shang Si, and I or I goes by Shang or Shai. Anything goes. And when I submit this talk, I was working at a school, National Taiwan University. And we're working on something that usually called learning management system, or LMS for short. Uh, things, things you might heard, such as Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, Seba, E3, are all what we call LMS. So we're building a new LMS we call Until Cool. And we, some background is that we have around eight engineers. Three of us were full-time, and the rest of them are part-time students. There's five of them. So not really that big of a team, but enough to do something. And my title there is uh, sysadmin. So my main task is to help manage the infrastructure. By infrastructure, I mean something like this. So these are the servers we have just underneath our, well, just a floor below our office. There's seven servers, three network attached storage, two switch. So it's not that many. That's why I, I, I sort of frame it as small scale, because we don't have anything close to a data center. It's just a few servers sitting there, but more than one. So in this situation, we there's some work that needs to be done to manage it. Not only we need to configure it um, physically, install it, and there's also the software part. So we do have, uh, we use Linux, and there's Ruby, there's Minio, there's, uh, there's Nginx, there's Apache and PostgreSQL, all those to configure. So it's quite a few things to do to get the whole thing up and running. And uh, Let's go to the next slide. So with all those things, with a small team, with me mainly focus on infrastructure and, and having some servers to manage, there's actually one problem that annoys me the most. So that problem is that it's hard for me or anyone else to, uh, to create or to build NTU cool from scratch. Um, but by building from scratch, I mean it's something like getting from nothing to here. So you have a server that's empty with nothing installed, and you have to install Linux, you have to install everything, then there's also the configuration. And it's annoying because it causes, uh, the problem have some consequences. The first major consequence is it's, it's an entry barrier. Whenever we try to recruit new engineers, uh, either full-time or part-time, and it usually take them quite a while to get started before they even could start development. They need to set up the whole thing. And it takes a really long time in, in my perspective. So for full-time engineers, it could take maybe a few days, but for part-time, because they don't come so often, by the time they set up the whole thing and start development, it might be already a few weeks or maybe if they're really unlucky, it, it could take months. And th this is not only a problem for development, it's also a problem for uh, production. So for the server where we serve our users, the student and the teachers who get angry when something broke. And um, the problem I would r like to refer to as rotting server, because it's a situation where since it's so hard to set up the whole thing, we usually just try to do it once and just just leave it there, like never touch again. So if something goes wrong, we will go inside and try to perhaps make as little changes as possible, minor changes, 
and then just go back out and hope everything will be okay again and forever. But that usually don't happen. Something more will go wrong or some new upgrade need to be installed. So those changes all pile up, pile up, and a little bit. And the more this happens, the less we know about the server, how to set it up as a whole, and the less we're confident making changes. It's sort of a vicious cycle going down and down. So the less confident you are, the less willing you're, to look into, you're going to look into it and make changes to make it better. So it just, uh, I call it rotting, that's why, because it just gets worse and worse. And for that prop, for this problem, I think it's a huge one, because setting up something from nothing to 100% is a lot to do. So applying the divide and conquer principle, I try to make it to a small, try to diagnose it and see what smaller problem I could find within it. So the first problem, I think, is that Installing an operating system is hard. So, I mean, uh, it's usually not that often you would reinstall your Windows or Mac, and they come pre-installed for a reason. And um, to install our operating system, the lin we use Ubuntu Linux. So you first have to download the Ubuntu Linux installation image. Then you need to write uh, create a bootable USB from the installation image, and then go to the server room, start configuration, and start installation. So it takes a lot of time. That's the first part. It, it's a lot of manual work. And because it's a lot of manual work, it is also quite error prone. So it's easy to make mistakes. For example, when I'm creating a bootable USB, I need to consider the fact that whether the server I am using boots through UEFI or BIOS, that that makes a difference, and that's that that got me stuck for a few days for the first time because I couldn't even install Linux on my server. <sighs> so, beside the uh, beside the error prone process, there's also the problem of inconsistency, because we have a few uh, few of us will install the Linux on our server, around four, I guess. And every everyone kind of installed the server differently. So I might configure the time zone with UTC. Someone else might configure it with Asia Taipei. And there's also the username and password issue. And how do you even get others to log in? So the SSH key, how, how should it be shared? So there's a lot of inconsistency here. That's why I, believe, I think the first hard problem is that um, installing operating system is hard. Now, the second problem, I think it's smaller. It's after I have the operating system installed and configured, how do I um, install my software stack on it? So the, the, uh, the Apache, the Ruby, and the PostgreSQL, basically them. And apt get install is the easy part. So installing is not that hard. But configuration and getting it right and and make sure the configuration uh, is known to everybody is quite an issue. So those are the true problems that I look out to solve. But before that, I would like to sidetrack a bit, um, talk about cloud. So you might be sit there wondering, like, why are you guys still buying your physical servers? Why not cloud? Um, I think cloud is actually great. So if you use something, uh, the cloud providers, like Amazon Web Service, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, all that, you, I don't think you ever need to install an o operating system yourself. And, and that's great. And if you could even do more, such as restructure your application to use uh, the service such as Lambda, uh, Cloud Function, those called serverless, or maybe something like App Engine. It's even better. You, you don't even need to manage the servers, so the cloud provider will manage for you. And I would really like to have that, but unfortunately for our, um, for our situation, it's 
it's well, I understand we, we couldn't buy those cloud services due to how the project is structured for us and how and the investment we already have inside the physical surface. So since we can use cloud, the only way is try to solve a problem. Um, the first problem is just like I said, the operating system installation, get in Linux from your empty server um, installed. And how can I make operating system installation sort of better, at least better than before? Well, there is, there's one idea that I came across. It's, it says, uh, if it hurts, do it more often, which is con kind of against our instinct, because usually when you find something is hard and when it hurts, you just leave it alone. Like what we do to our server, we just like set up and forget it. Um, but the, the idea is that actually if it hurts, you should do it more often. Because the more often you do, the better you get at it and the more you can optimize it. And usually those things that hurts are those things that hurts more when you, the longer you don't do it. It's like an exponential curve that goes up. So if you do it very often, the, it doesn't really hurt that much. The cost is very low. So I set up to find a tool that can help me install the operating system more often. And the tool I came across is called Metal as a Service, or MAS for short. Um, so not, not surprisingly, MAS is uh, written in mostly Python. It's with, as of version three, the, the 2.3, the version I use, is a bit dated. Um, it's using Django and Twisted as, a fr as its framework. And what, so the first, the, the setup is really easy. Just again, the installation is usually R. So just apt get install, you're done. Some configuration, but I think it's, it's not that difficult. The interesting part, however, um, is what MAS does. So the first time I use MAS, I think it's, it's like magic. It just, it just works. The first thing I do is, of course, install MAS. Then I plug in a server that has nothing installed into the, the network, so connect it in the same network as MAS. Then I start a server, and it powers on. It says booting under the direction of MAS. Then a few minutes, it appears in my MAS web's UI. I then click, um, and it, it appears in the UI with the CPU, the RAM, the disk size, all that. Then I can just click installed, say I want Ubuntu Xenio, and it just, it just finished in five, I think around five to 10 minutes, within 10, I, I'm pretty sure. And what I get is a fully functional OS with the network configure, the disk partition, and all the user account, sudo privilege, SSH key, uh, it's already all set up. So kind of like what you get with um, cloud providers, GCP with Compute Engine or EC2 with AWS, but for your own servers. And compared to before, it's really much easier. I think before it would take me around, I guess half an hour for the whole thing to be sorted. And I start to wonder, like, is this really advanced technology or magic? So I try to look into it. And what I, f I think it's quite interesting how it works as a whole to get the OS installed. So to get my server installed, must start with a discovery phase, also called enlistment in mass terms. And what it does is really just finding your servers. So finding your server is there and it's specs. So what RAM, what CPU. And this is done in a, with, basic, uh, with mainly a technology called pre-boot execution environment or PXE for short. So what happened is that when you have a brand new server and you install, connect network to it and power it up, usually it will try to 
some, find something bootable in a hard drive, CD-ROM, or USB. And since it's new, um, it doesn't find any. So it proceeds to the next thing that's usually called network boot. Um, network boot will send out a, 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 a broadcast message asking for what IP it can use, as well as another thing is what PXE server could send bootable file to it. And in this case, MAS will answer with its DHCP server saying that, hey, come here, I have a file, and use this IP, by the way. And with that, our server will go to retrieve a bootable file, just like how you would boot from a USB and CD, except it's through the network. And after multiple stages, it will boot into a fully functional Linux. So with Linux, you can do a bunch of things everybody, as everybody ha knows. Oh, okay. So with, after it boots into Linux, it has some uh, customized script that will try to find out whether your server, how many CPU your server has, how many RAMs, how many disks, what network it connects to it, and, and something even more, sometimes even the firmware it's using. So really, a lot of information is collected and sent back to the mass server so you can see it. And one more thing it does after the discovery phase is that it will shut down the server. So at the first, I kind of wonder, like, why does it shut down my server? I, I still need the power on. And well, the thing is, uh, Mass is right, really trying to be, be nice to you. It tries to save you power. Because after you discover the server is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that you want it itself. You might just want it, it. It could just sit there and just do nothing. So to be nice, Mass shut down the server for you to save uh, save energy. Be nice to the environment. And when it Mass needs to install or do other thing to a server, it can go through an interface called Intelligent Platform Management Service uh, interface. So IPMI for short. If you use HP server, it might, called, it might be called Integrated Lightout, ILO, or I guess Drag if you use Dell servers. And it's really a, a godsend for system administration because I can control the power on and power off, restart, just like I'm standing right beside it through the network. And there's even more I could do. I could connect to the terminal even though the, the operating system isn't boot up yet. It's sort of like a backdoor, if you think about it. It's a backdoor that lets you access your server almost like physically without actually being there. So in a sense, it's, it's dangerous if used in a bad way. So after Mass finds out, ooh, after Mass finds out where your, what your server is, it goes to the installation phase, or what it calls deployment. And the, to deploy, uh, to install an OS onto your server, MAS use something called Curtain, or the Curt installer. It's another tool by the same company that I forgot to mention. Uh, MAS and Curtain is all, by, uh, all created by a company called Canonical, which is the company beside Ubuntu. The current installer will take some configuration provided by MAS. And it will say, perhaps, run the apt-get command when you start, and then partition the disk VDC in, in the simple way. I, I guess that's using the FAT file system. And last but not least, use the following file as your source. So, it will download this file, usually located on your mass server, so it's really fast. Download the file and just extract the file onto the, the disk. That's part of the reason that makes the installation really fast, because that's all you need to do. Extract the file, and you're done. But just extracting the file is not the whole story, because the file is actually used quite uh, this, this, this file that is used to install, 
it's actually used by many users. So in this different situation, maybe different cloud providers. So just using the image is not enough. There are something that you need to do after you install. Um, they use the tool called Cloud Init to do that. And I think this is a really interesting tool that's worth mentioning. Cloud Init is a tool that is also by Canonical, but I believe that they are also used by other cloud providers like GCP or AWS. What it does is they want they they want the idea of make image once and run use everywhere. So the image will be the one I just showed. Some maybe Ubuntu image that is very generic that everyone could use. But when it started, Cloud Init will do uh, things that customize your your machine to the environment. For example, in this situation, uh, Cloud Init will take a file called the Cloud Config, and it, it will create some group Ubuntu Cloud users, and create also some user. Um, the default for Ubuntu will be Ubuntu, and also, it will create another bar for user. And I would like to talk a little bit more about Cloud Init. So, Cloud, if most people um, might know about Init, that's a program that the Linux kernel will start after it, after it's finished setting itself up. It's the first program that they will run. And Cloud Init sort of gets its name from Init except, of course, the prefix cloud. So after init is done, the idea is to have cloud init do rest of the basic configuration to have the system in a usable state inside cloud. And that will include not just maybe the user account setting, but ma many things such as network or the, or the SSH key are configured to cloud init. Now, uh, those are the things that must use to get the operating system installed. But while I really like it, there's a few gotchas if you ever want to use MAS that I'm not really aware of. The first gotcha I think that, that sort of hurt me the most is that I never realized that when I installed an operating system with MAS, your operating system will depend on MAS for the rest of its life. What I mean is that uh, the operating system will try to resolve any domain names through MAS with, it, with the DNS server MAS hosted. So in any case, when MAS is down, perhaps you want to upgrade, or perhaps you just broke something, your servers will fail to resolve domain name. So no google.com and apt-get will probably fail and even more, if you try to do sudo if that situation, it will take a really long time. It will take probably one to five minutes doing nothing because sudo actually try to resolve a domain, uh, resolve your host name before it starts running. And that's, that's kind of not so, not so fun when it happened. But must do come with other configuration that they call it high availability mode, which is they run multiple instances of mass. So if one is, goes down, you still have the other to use. So it, it should be okay if you deploy in the high availability mode. For me, I just use a single server. So probably a bit more problematic for me. And the other gotcha I face is stock installation. Sometimes when I try to get mass to install, it'll get stuck for maybe 30 minutes or so. And there's no really a way to, mass doesn't really notify you of this. It just keep on trying and trying and trying. So you have to go in there and abort the installation and restart it again. Usually that time it'll go through. So it don't, it gets stuck, but if you restart it, it'll work. And the last thing about mass that's really not a gotcha, but I think it's worth also worth mentioning is that it is really quite a complex piece of soft software because 
the problem mass facing the installation of operating system on either physical or virtual server is a complex one. You have so many kinds of physical server, um, quite a few kind of virtual server, and so many kind of hardware to be aware, uh, be aware of. So it's really a complex thing. And to solve this complex problem, MAS use a lot of different software under the hood. It uses such as uh, ISC, DHCP for DHCP, and BIND for DNS, TGT for iSCSI. Each of them all, all comes with their own configuration and sometimes even the demo process. So as much as MAS try to present itself as one service, it's usually a lot of different components that try to work together. So I, I think it's reasonable that sometimes something gets wrong. And all in all, I think MAS is doing a really great job for what I'm trying to get, which is making operating system install much better. And I would like to mention some alternative tooling. So if you're you're looking into perhaps a similar problem, such as getting your infrastructure set up. One, one, one alternative tool is called OpenStack. And I, I suggest you avoid it if you have really lots of lots of resource and lots of servers, because it's a really complex piece of software that might not fit well for a small infrastructure, for, for me, when I have just seven servers, it's, it seems a bit too much, although it offers a lot of functionality. So I didn't try OpenStack, but I did try a few other tools that sort of fell into the same domain as Mass in installing the operating system. Uh, the first one is Clover. It's been there quite a while. I tried to, uh, I use it, but I find it's mostly on setting up the PXE boot image, so the pre-executing boot image, and it doesn't offer that much functionality in terms of discovering your new server and all the others. Um, Spacewalk, I didn't try, but you might want to look into it. The, the third one is Foreman. Foreman, I think it's actually more popular than Mass. And it has a more user base, and but it mainly focus on sent OS. I think I'm not really that sure because I, I failed to get it installed, so I never really tried to use it. And after some research, it seems to be it, it doesn't come with discovering your service automatically. It comes as a plugin. So since I failed to install Foreman, um, I just didn't look into it further. There's also two other tools that fell into the same uh, category. That's one is Digital Rebar, one is called Razor. So there is actually quite a lot of tools that try to solve this kind of problem. But for some reason, I'm not sure that they seem, they, they don't seem to have that much popularity, and I have no idea why. And lastly, Mass also provides a function that it can manage the IP address for you. A similar tool would be called Netbox, which is some, a tool that the DigitOcean Digital Ocean release under open source. Uh, if that's, that's your main issue, you might want to look into it as well. So that is the first part of my talk. I think that that's where I spent I'll spend most of the time, and I'll try to look into Slido if there's any question. Nope. Okay. Did I get it right? Um, some, some help, maybe? Wait. Okay, I, I, I have no idea how to use Slido. Um, so 
if anyone have question about the first part, the installation, the operating system, and mass, and perhaps other things, uh, you might want to ask now. Uh, okay, so I'll continue to the second part. Okay, thank, thanks for... Uh, 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 so the second part is about the system's software dependency and configuration. I'll just spend a, a little bit of time on this. Uh, the, so the system uh, the software dependency configuration is a part where I try to get the uh, PostgreSQL, Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails apps all installed and configured. For that, I use a tool called Ansible. It's quite popular, so it's possible that you have already heard it. The nice thing about it is that you can write in the declarative syntax that what you want to have. So, for example, this is an example where I could get NGIC installed, I would say that I want NGIX to be installed through APT with its version, uh, with its latest version. And then I want to make sure that the NGIX server is started. The nice thing about this is that if you try to do this in shell script, it's usually more error prone because you need to first check that whether you have it installed, or whether it's up already, whether it's broken, and many, there's many things to check. But with Ansible and the declarative, declarative syntax, it's usually easier to get a script that, when you run it, just gets to the result you want. It will figure out how to do that automatically for you through, through its models. So Ansible has a lot of individual models that do all the hard work. For example, the first task is using the APT module. The second task will be using the surface module. And it's nice that usually you could write something that mostly work across different operating system. And, and, it's, and personally, I like YAML, so that's a plus for me. So YAML is the syntax that's that's shown here. It's kind of like JSON, but personally, I think it's easier to read. And under the hood, Ansible is just using the uh, Ansible modules, as well as a package called Paramico. Paramico, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Paramico is a SSH library for a Python. Well, it allows Ansible to do is to SSH into computers, uh, into your servers, and transport a script to it, the Ansible module, and run it and return the result. So the Ansible module might be just a script writing apt get installed nginx. And that's quite nice because there, there is nothing else that I need to set up because before I use Ansible. As long as I have a server that works with SSH, I, and, and has Python on it, I could use Ansible. And that's the main reason I choose Ansible. There is some similar tool to Ansible, such as uh, Chef, Puppet, Solstack, and Caspriano. Some of them need you to have an independent server running there, um, waiting, waiting for the request. Uh, but Ansible doesn't need one. So it fits well in my situation where I just have a few servers to manage. I don't want to set up an extra server just for that. And it seemed to be simpler to use in, in my personal opinion. So if you're ever trying to find a, a tool such as Ansible, sometimes called configuration management tool, um, the one thing you might want to think is push versus pull. There is two way to initiate a system configuration. For Ansible, it's push. 
So an external force will push the configuration into your server, like how I in initiate Ansible to install Nginx on my server. But I, I believe maybe Puppet, maybe I'm not sure which one, but there's some, some software that use the pull mechanisms. So it will active, the, the server will actively ask the, oh, sorry, the server will actively ask a puppet server, like, hey, what's the newest configuration? What, what should I do? What do I need to do now? And the server will reply it with message telling what it does. And that might work that, that doesn't seem to work so well for my situation because I want to be in, in control. But I, there's quite a lot of user base for a puppet. So I think it's worked for probably other situation. And going forward, these, the software configuration and installation, I would, I'm trying to look into doc, building a container image. So with Docker, the reason is that is even though I have Ansible and all these tooling to properly install the software and the configuration, it's just really hard to get a clean state sometimes. What I mean is that sometimes you just have some file left over in your system and then it will cause Ansible to break while it's running. With Docker, it seems easier that you can start with clean states, just telling, you, telling Docker what image you want to use and it'll pull a clean image for you. So that's what I tried to work on before I left, but it, it never got done. And I'll skip this part and talk a bit about the idea of um, infrastructure as code. So as you have noticed, there's a lot of uh, configuration that looks like this in YAML. So it's machine readable and also both human readable, I guess. So the idea is that version control for your application is nice. It's really great. Like when you version control your source code, you can see who done what and probably diagnose what, what's the cause of your, of your bug. And it's a really nice idea that people are trying to incorporate into infrastructure management. So instead of manual configuring all the settings and just, just leave it there, um, and maybe perhaps documentation, why not have something that you can version control and when you give it to your software, will produce the identical state that you get. So that's one thing that's worth uh, Googling if anyone's interested. And there's the other thing I want to talk about, which is, sh so given this situation, automation seems to be nice. Should we automate everything? Is that the right thing to do? And I think it really depends on your situation. Probably, most of the time, probably not. Uh, but you want to find a balance. So the, the more you try to automate, the usually the higher the cost it'll be. You need to spend more, more time to have one hundred uh, from ninety percent coverage, from to ninety five, just like unit tests. And but if you don't automate as much, there's also cost related to it because you might make an error or you might spend a lot of time doing it. And I think there. So depend on the situation, you need to find a balance. You don't need to automate everything, but you need to find a way that makes probably makes your cost the, at the minimum. So that's some that's all my talk. So the, if you don't remember anything, um, just try to use cloud if you can, so you don't need to go through all the trouble. Um, thank you. And if there's any question. Uh, the question. If there are some CVE on your Nginx or SQL server, how do you patch it? Is there any SOP or some experience that you can share? Okay. Um, 
To be honest, I'm probably not the most fit to answer this question. The, 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 way, the ideal way for me is to perhaps update the Ansible configuration and deploy the configuration to the server. But usually what I do is I just go in SSH inside and install. And even more of the time, I, I don't really do anything unless I'm really sure that it's public facing. So for the SQL Server, I probably won't do anything if, if, it's, not, if, if it's not severe. For the NGINX, I might. But I don't actually follow the CVE so well, so I, I'm just not that. The, I, I don't really answer th this question so well. When use mass, is there any authentication mechanism need to set up before machine discovery? Uh, the way I'm using it, there's no. Uh, um, there is so there is the authentication of, of course, the per user authentication. Um, so to use mass, you have to be authenticated with the user account. But I think. This question is asking uh, whether the server need to be authenticated for it to be discovered, I guess. And the answer to that is, I think there isn't an authentication mechanism. It's based on trust within the network system. So if you can connect to this network, the server is trusted. That's, that's what I believe, but it might have changed I'm not that sure either. And question? Mark, thank you. Thanks for SHY. Um, next session, useful tools to explain machine learning models will begin 1.55 p.m. <laughs>